Okay, welcome back. We move forward with our next session. And uh, the next session is on stellar physics and compact stars. It will be given, uh, delivered, the talk will be delivered by Professor Dr. Mayang Vaya. So I'll just introduce the speaker. Mayang Vaya completed his PhD in astrophysics in 1984 from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. After completing his PhD, he continued to work at TIFR until his retirement in 2018 as professor. During his research career in TIFR, he worked on making and practicing space telescopes that were flown on American, Russian and Indian satellites. For the past two decades, he has been interested in the history of science and astronomy as well as the impact of science and on society as well as evolution of civilizations. In the context of the history of astronomy, he has been interested in megalithic astronomy, tribal astronomy, rock art astronomy, astronomy of monuments as well as ancient text. He has published more than 250 research papers during his career out of which more than 50 are on his interest in the history of science and astronomy. He has edited uh, seven books and published four books and uh, has made four science films including one on Gond astronomy. He initiated the astronomy as well as uh, junior science uh, Olympiad program in India and guided them for more than a decade. He was the director of Nehru Planetarium in Mumbai for a year. He, he is a fellow of several uh, academic nationally and internationally uh, and has been on the list of referees of several national and international journals. He has served as the governing council of Deccan College, Pune and Anantacharya Indological Institute, Mumbai and has been on the board of studies of Yashwantarao uh, Chauhan, Maharashtra Open University. After his retirement, he started an innovative school of mathematical science at the Narsi Monji Institute of Managemental Science, a deemed university in Mumbai. So, I request uh, Dr. Vahia, Professor Vahia to deliver his talk. Um, just one minute, please. Yeah, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah. It's fun. It's, uh, it's perfect. Hello. It's correct. It's okay. Oh, I'm still mute, is it? Yeah. It's fine. You have to make it full screen. Yeah, yeah just, 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 just one second, I think. Um, can you see me? Yeah, can you I can hear see. me? I can hear you, I can see you, I can see your slide also. But you then you can it. see my PowerPoint also. Yeah, you have to make it full screen, that's all. Okay, yeah, I suddenly right. realized that my title of my talk and I put in the PowerPoint was wrong, so I just changed it. I think it is Stellar Physics and Compact Stars is what yeah. I'm speaking Yes, on. yes, yes. Um, the content remains the same. I originally planned uh, the talk. My original title was Life History of Stars. Anyway, so what we are going to do is talk about stars and how stars are born, how they live and how they die. And uh, we, will, um, uh, we will see what um, how the life history of the star goes. But before we start on the stars themselves, we need to worry about light itself. How does light come? What is the information? How do we get information and so on? So let me quickly summarize what are the main features of, of light that you study as it comes towards you. We know that matter consists of atoms. So atoms have um, a nucleus in the center and electrons are going around it. And because of Pauli's explosion principle, etc., you have no more, no two electrons can remain in the same set of um, same state together. And so you have this um, structure of um, um, electrons around an atom. So there is a shell structure of um, around the nucleus where electrons of different energy um, live or um, stay. So you have an electron or neutron or nucleus over here and the electrons go around it, around the nucleus. For some reason, if you knock an uh, electron out, if you knock an electron out, then the electron goes out either to upper level or right out, right outside into uh, as a free electron and another electron jumps inside and as it jumps inside, it releases energy. Either it can jump from outside straight inside, in which case it will uh, release an enormous amount of energy, or it can do it in multiple steps, in which case you will have um, have uh, two or more photons coming out from that. The only way of producing electricity, remember, is to change the velocity of a charged particle. So in this case, we are putting it into deeper the potential well, so you get um, uh, a light of a certain wavelength, and because the potential well is deeper over here, um, the closer the electron is from the center, the more inter more energetic is the light. So if you take this level zero, 
on the ground level of a nucleus, then the electrons that come from the level 2 to level 1 have a certain energy. Those coming from 3 to 1 will have a higher energy and those coming from 4 to 1 will have the highest energy. Not only that, not only that, each, because each atom is unique in its structure, uh, each atom will have its own signature. So the kind of radiation that you get from each atom, uh, each kind of carbon spectrum is unique, hydrogen spectrum is unique, helium spectrum is unique and so on. And you can use that information. Now imagine if you have a, uh, a light source which is thermal in the sense that the material is so hot that just by heat the free electrons and free protons in the system will produce light. In which case of course there will be no line spectrum, it will be a continuum spectrum that you would expect. If you take that spectrum through a prism, you will get a continuum line like this where the intensity against wavelength will have this kind of a curve. Now imagine if there is a thin cloud over here between you and the source. Then that thin cloud will, add, um, will absorb some uh, light based on which elements are there in this cloud and therefore in that thermal spectrum that you had, you now have absorption lines. And because this cloud really can't hold on to this electron at excited state, eventually those electrons will re-emit at some random location and therefore if you look at it at a random location, You are not Just wait, uh, there is some problem, just we will fix, up, fix it up, just bear with us for some time. Um, but this would typically require a very high resolution. Uh, sir, uh, uh, you were not visible and audible for quite some time. Uh, maybe uh, you have to repeat that because you oh, got stuck. So, uh, which part did you miss? So, I think uh, after uh, you were showing this uh, spectrum and all those things, uh, that various types of spectrum. Uh, yes, so yeah. then this is the slide. Yeah, so maybe... Uh, you, I will repeat this slide. Yeah, yeah, you can start because you were not visible and not audible also. And your okay. slides also went away. Then just give me 10 seconds to change. I have two Wi Fi facilities. Yeah, this is the better one. 
Yeah, maybe you can once more share your slide uh, because the slide is also gone. I don't have this Wi-Fi problems. I actually have two two subscriptions. Okay, now can you see the slide? The no, slide. Slide has not come. You have to reshare it. It has gone. Okay. You can stop sharing and again share. I think yeah, yeah, that's what I, uh, now can you see the spectrum? Uh, the yeah, slide? yeah, yeah, yeah. It has come. It has come. So you can okay. go back. You can go back some design. Uh, this before this, before before. I think from here you have to start. From here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, like I said, uh, the atom has a structure, and each element's atom has its own unique structure. So you have uh, the nucleus in the middle. And then you have electrons that go around that atom. And if you knock an electron out of an atom, uh, another electron will try and come and fill its place. If that comes from outer region and fills the inner region, it will give you some amount of emission. And this electron can either go jump straight inside or can do in multiple steps. So for example, if you have a, a, a zero level over here, then an electron can come from two, level two to level one and it will have certain light. It can come from 3 to 1 and because from 3 to 1 it is really jumping a deep potential well it has a higher energy photon and if it comes from 3 to 1 it has an even higher energy photon. So depending on which transition is occurring you actually get um, different um, for energy photon and also the fact uh, that each because of each element has its own signature um, electron um, this uh, electron structure each uh, element will have a unique signature of which are the wavelengths in which it is emitting. So you can actually get a sig about idea about what and what are you some region in the universe consists of based on the spectrum that you see. Then there's an additional complication. Imagine that you have a thermal spectrum over here, a region that is so hot that the electrons are essentially free from their nuclei and therefore these free electrons can slow down and, um, um, at uh, random energies and therefore you have a continuum thermal spectrum that you uh, normally see. If you take this light source, pass it through a prism, you get the continuum Planck spectrum that you would expect. On the other hand, if the, there is a thin cloud in between you and the source, then the material in that thin cloud will absorb that light and when it absorbs that light, you will get this kind of absorption lines in the spectrum. So you can see an absorption line like this. But electrons, the, the atoms in this thin um, cloud cannot really hold on to these excited electrons, so the electrons will jump back into the neutral state, but at a random direction. So if you look at it in the random direction, you get the emission line corresponding to the absorption lines here. So just by looking at whether you are getting a thermal spectrum from a star, an absorption line feature or an, or an emission line feature from a random location, you can say whether between you, the source and you there is a cloud, and if there is a cloud, what does it consist of? based on the spectrum that you have. So spectra and uh, absorption and emission lines actually give you a lot of information about what anything in the universe consists of even to greatest distances and to the earliest uh, time periods. Uh, this is an example if you have at the bottom the thermal spectrum then if there is the, if the cloud consists of iron then you will have an absorption line feature that looks like this. If you have hydrogen you will have an absorption feature like this. And in between you have the emission feature of hydrogen, sodium, uh, helium and neon. And you can see that each element will only emit at a particular uh, uh, set of wavelengths. And therefore you can uniquely identify a universe anywhere in the, uh, uh, you can uniquely identify an element anywhere in the universe based on either the emission or absorption spectra as the case may be. So that's a very powerful tool. So for example, if you take continuum spectrum from say something like Sirius, then you can pass it through a prism and even what seems like continuum if you have a sufficiently good spectrograph you can actually see these absorption lines which typically consist of material in between the star and us. Normally we do not have very high resolution so if you really look at the spectrum of Sirius you would get something like this but that is still good enough to tell you what is the material in between us and the star and what is happening at the star itself because you can get the Planck curve based on this uh, removing these absorption lines and absorption lines will give you features that are typical of the interstellar medium. So, but, but, but these interstellar medium lines, etc., were known for a long time, but people wanted to know how to convert it into physics. 
So Meghnath Saha was the first one to do that when writing a book on commentary on um, thermodynamics, he came up with this equation. So in 1920, uh, Saha said that this absorption in physics is straightforward. He says, if you take any atom in which uh, the number of electrons in the state I plus 1 compared to those in state I is defined by, uh, defined by 2 by lambda cube, lambda which is uh, de Broglie wavelength for uh, the electron, um, uh, GI plus 1 and GI is simply the number of uh, degeneracy, how many electrons can be there in each of these levels. And then exponential e, by e, e, e I plus 1 minus EI, which is simply the energy level requirement. And it is strict, only dependent on the temperature. There is no density involvement in this. So if I know, take a spectrum like this and take helium spectrum, and if I know the relative intensity of helium, um, two lines of helium, then I know the number density of helium in stage excited stage I plus 1 compared to excited stage I, and I can determine the temperature of this object. So even for example, just to go back to the previous example, even in situation like this, where I do not have uh, any uh, thermal spectrum, I can still use Saha's formulation to determine the temperature of, uh, of the cold region from which the line has come. So Saha equation has become one of the classics of uh, spectral, uh, spectrography because it shows that there is no density dependent, there is only a temperature dependent which is solvable and Ni, by, Ni plus 1 by Ni is measurable. So uh, epsilon, uh, I plus 1 minus epsilon can be determined from the lab. Uh, GI plus 1 and GI can also be determined from the lab and as also lambda cube and so except for this temperature term and therefore you can get determine the temperature of any region in the universe if you get absorption or emission lines coming from that region. And this equation therefore permits you to convert stellar spectra into non, uh, knowledge of their atmosphere and if there are multiple lines you can actually see even the layering of atmospheric temperature in a star and so on. So it's, it's a very powerful technique. But then there is an additional feature that happens. If you have an object that is moving towards you or uh, towards you or away from you, you get a change in frequency of light. So, for example, um, you all, if you if you've been ever standing at a station where a train comes towards you, you can actually see that as long as the engine is coming towards you and whistling, the sound uh, pitch appears a little sharper. And if the engine is going away from you, it, the the pitch appears um, a little more uh, less uh, sharp. And that is true even for light. So light will be blue shifted if you are uh, if the object is moving towards you, and it will be red shifted if it is moving away from you. Now obviously that means that a single line cannot determine for you the elemental composition of wherever you are looking at, because uh, that line may be red shifted from somewhere else, or it could be genuinely an emission line from that region. So you need a whole set of lines to be able to determine the red shift, blue shift, and the temperature. But you can determine motion, you can determine content, and you can determine uh, temperatures of hot and cold regions based on uh, spectroscopy. And that is a useful thing to have. Then there are colors of the stars. If you look at a class uh, feature, if, if you look at um, star, uh, sky, night sky, and pass the light through prism instead of looking it directly in the eyepiece, you would get something like this. So this is a region of the sky where there is Canopus, um, one of the bright stars of Canopus is over here. And you can see that it is emitting in all wavelengths. On the other end, there is gamma pic, which is emitting largely in red and very little bit in yellow. Then there is beta dot, which is emitting, which is which has a larger emission in um, uh, red and um, uh, beyond red in yellow and green compared to say uh, ga gamma pic. You can see the spectral differences. And also delta dot is, for example, somewhat seems somewhat similar to uh, gamma pic and so on. But stars have color. And supernova 1987a is something we are going to talk about at, uh, at length a little later down the line. But you can clearly see that the spectra of stars are not the same. And that is related to the temperature of the star. So a ta star that is at 6000 degrees Kelvin uh, will emit much, much more energy. So there is energy on the y-axis, there is wavelength in the x-axis. And if you take... Um, and this is uh, ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays, and this is infrared, um, infrared, then um, um, microwave, and so on. What you see is that if a star is at 6,000 degrees Kelvin, its emission peaks nicely in yellow, and then keeps coming down. If if the temperature is 5,000 degrees Kelvin, then it rises, in fact, in infrared, and then comes down in the optical light. 
Um, if the, the star is at 4000 degrees Kelvin, the, the peak comes well, uh, very early in the um, infrared and then actually the emission in optical light is very small and a 3000 degree star can barely be seen as a red star. So just look at this star and it will immediately tell you to go to the previous picture that this star is a red star, this star is a red star while this is a proper um, star at 6000 degrees Kelvin or even more. So you can determine the temperature of a star by knowing in which wavelength it emits maximum. The sun has a surface temperature of about 5500 degrees Kelvin so it peaks somewhere over here and therefore our eyes are tuned to the wavelengths in which the, eye, uh, the sun emits maximum amount of its energy. That's why we all have white light visibility instead of infrared or extra visibility because the sun emits very little in X-rays or gamma rays and the emits less even in infrared compared to what it emits in optical wavelength. So you have this equation again which is um, dependent on the temperature of the object that will emit uh, light and this is the Planck curve which is useful. Because what it means is that because these curves are non-crossing and uh, unique, any absorption, any, any feature measured at any two wavelengths over here, uh, you can solve this equation and get the temperature. You don't always have to get the peak, but if you take any two regions in which you measure the temperature, you can do a Planck curve fit and determine the temperature of anything. And that is where it is so useful. And even for thermal plus spectra, you can determine the temperature without difficulty. And then there are stars of various temperatures. So Betelgeuse, for example, is at 3000 degrees Kelvin. Arcturus is at 4000 degrees Kelvin. Sun is at about 5500 degrees Kelvin. Sirius is 11000 Kelvin. And Spica is 5000 or 25000 degrees Kelvin. And you can see that this is more or less red and this is more or less blue. Sirius is white. The sun is a yellowish star. And in fact, the peak temperature. Um, and uh, the, the, the wavelength at which you get maximum emission and the temperature of the star are connected by a simple constant of 0.3 if you wish in centimeter Kelvin level. So if you know the temperature, you know at where, what wavelength it will peak and if you know the wavelength at which the light has peaked, you can determine the temperature of that region. And this Wayne's displacement law. These were early laws that came up purely for observation and eventually, of course, the physics, once the physics became clear, once the Planck curve, etc. became clear, it was obvious that these equations were cool. But they are very useful, handy equations to use. So, with that much background, let us look at the birth of a star. Stars are born when interstellar material compresses. In this case, what you see is the star is being born over here and what you see is that the dark matter is being uh, the dust and the cloud uh, material of the star is coalescing around the star to eventually ignite the star over here. So you can have a star which is born in a cloud where gradually material is being collected to form the star. And uh, this is played is you can see that uh, the stars are gradually forming and clearing up the eating of the material around them and becoming um, stars like these. You can see these kind of stars in the sky. On the other hand, if there is some reason where there is a trigger of shock, so for example, you have here the Hubble's uh, picture of uh, uh, the pillars of creation in Eagle Nebula, you can see that the shock going through from the death of a star results in compression of the interstellar medium in, sudden, in a sudden manner and you get ignition of star formation. So there are new stars being born over here from this uh, supernova remnant. That remnant. There are new stars being formed over here, there are new stars being formed over here and in regions where the interstellar medium is very light, this one has zoomed through and eventually found enough material to compress and which will resist its movement over here. In this case, the, the stoppage has been earlier. So this gives you an idea that the interstellar medium itself is fairly uh, inhomogeneous. It is very, um, at places it is very dense, at places where it is not very dense and a supernova explosion explodes those uh, interstellar medium and compresses it to making stars. So the first way of making stars is to simply gradually collect material and ignite stars or you can do it by shock front. This is the Eagle and Nebula again showing spectacularly how this little region had less interstellar density so material went shoots through it but eventually got stopped where new star ignitions are happening. So what you have essentially is that if you have a cloud of material which is just hanging around doing nothing and if a wave passes through it, it will produce a shock front and in those shock front you will have star formation. 
and that physics is is not very difficult to derive essentially what happens is if the material is compressed enough it will produce heat and you will get a star formation so let us look at this pressure balance um, around stars uh, so what you get is that the, the the pressure of the gas at any region is simply a question of density and temperature and then the gas constants that go with that the radiation that this pressure produces will go as temperature raised to 4 and A is simply a radiation constant. So there is a radiation pressure outward which goes as the fourth power of temperature. There is an inner pressure which goes as, as uh, linearly with temperature. So essentially even minor temperature imbalance will now produce um, uh, some spectacular effect. And um, um, at the, uh, and the pressure of the gas to pressure of the um, uh, radiation can be given simply as T cube upon rho. So if the rho is very um, uh, low, then what happens is the radiation pressure is very high and the star will disintegrate. But if rho is very high, once you cross a critical density, then it will exceed this T cube and essentially pressure of the gas will be higher than the radiation pressure and you will get the formation of a star. The balance between radiation pressure which is trying to push away the material and the material gas pressure which is trying to take the material into the gravitational potential will give you star formation. So Jean's criteria exists which says that in any given region if you have um, a gas that is that is uh, there then the, at any given radius from any point the, uh, the rate of change of pressure is simply given by gravity into rho which is the total mass, the amount of mass that is included in that region by the square of the radius. So in a, in a protostellar situation like the one I, did, I showed you here, in this kind of a picture where there is a R over here, you will get dp by, by dr equal to this. And if this dp by dr is positive, then you will have a star formation. Um, so essentially in the, those conditions, then in the middle, a lot of material gets compressed inside because the gas pressure is very high and gravitation pull is very strong and the radiation is not able to keep it up. But at this stage, uh, you get therefore a protostar over here and I will explain protostar a little in <laughs> a few moments and then that radiation goes out and there is an opacity gap where there is very little opacity and the material keeps going out. Eventually that radiation gets stopped somewhere along the edge and over here then you have a convection kind of uh, effect where the heat is now being dissipated through convection and then you have the outermost surface of the star which is given by this dotted line. So you have the star in the center which is producing the heat for uh, whichever means it wants either by pressure or whatever it is and we will see that it has, in a case of a star it happens with nuclear reactions and then you have a nuclear reactor in the middle then you have radiation coming out from that nuclear reactor and then you have the edge where material is being absorbed where the heat is being absorbed and then you get heating by convection. It almost looks like the, um, the heat, gas heating at home where you have the flame in the center then there is a distance between the, um, the flame and the, and the vessel in which you have put the material to be heated and then the material to be heated is essentially heated by convective heating and almost the same thing happens um, in the star. So you have this kind of a feature. Then if you go uh, well, ask yourself what is happening in the, uh, in the core, then in the core primarily what happens is that hydrogen and hydrogen are now brought, hydrogen atoms are brought so close to each other at temperatures of about 6 million degrees and in um, a stellar core that the hydrogen will fuse to give you deuterium. As it gives you deuterium, a positron and some gamma rays will be emitted which will take away the energy, binding energy from here and you will also get a neutrino. And then hydrogen, hydrogen becomes deuterium, deuterium takes one more hydrogen and you get helium-3. And then the two helium-3 can merge to give you helium-4. So essentially what you have done is taken 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hydrogen atoms, uh, 4 of them have got converted into uh, helium and the 2 of them have got, uh, have been re-emitted as hydrogen atoms and then they pass take part in the nuclear reactions. But in turn a lot of heat has been generated. Heat was generated when deuterium came into being, when helium-3 came into being and when helium-4 came into being. And that produces the heat, just to go back to the previous picture, produces heat in the middle that prevents the star from collapsing because now the pressure balance that I told you earlier will work in such a way that you have stability when these entities are comparable. When the radiation pressure and gas pressure are comparable, 
then you will have a stable structure over here and you will get the formation of stars i told you about the proton proton chain but there is also a carbon nitrogen oxygen chain where carbon actually works like a like a, like a catalyst where it takes hydrogen carbon 12 then it takes a hydrogen become nitrogen 13 and then it's heat nitrogen 13 goes on to decay to become carbon 13 through electron positive uh, positron emission and um, carbon 13 then decays into nitrogen 14 nitrogen 14 can take a hydrogen again emitting energy hydrogen nitrogen 14 can take one more oxygen to become oxygen 15 oxygen 15 is unstable become nitrogen 15 and eventually nitrogen 15 will dissociate into uh, carbon 12 and helium 4 so essentially in this case also it takes in four hydrogen atoms at different stages and carbon comes back as carbon but the um, the four protons have now become helium and for charge balance of course it has released two positrons so two positrons plus all this energy each of these stages produces heat the only problem is that this uh, in order that new uh, nuclear reactions happen to car um, um, carbon it should absorb a hydrogen the hydrogen has to have much greater velocity than it was proton if it was proton proton because the repulsive force is now six times bigger it has six protons so it requires much greater energies to do that so this carbon catalysis cycles do happen but for for star like sun that is not very significant because the sun is a small star but for larger star you can also use uh, carbon in the star as a catalyst to produce nuclear reactions and then this hydro and then it was the same and proton proton reaction which is very common and then you have three helium fours when two helium four, uh, fours merge they become beryllium the problem with beryllium is that it is very vulnerable to nuclear reaction so even a passing proton can destroy beryllium so as soon as beryllium is born very quickly you have to add a third helium in order to for carbon 12 to form and this produces a gap in nucleosynthesis or synthesis of elements in the star because lithium beryllium boron all three elements that is z equal to 3 4 and 5 are very vulnerable to nuclear reactions and therefore you don't get them in large quantities so the lithium in your batteries that you get in your telephones is is a very rare rare earth element because it is not so easy to get because in stars lithium burns up very uh, easily and all the elements that we have in our periodic table come from the core of stars so uh, beryllium lithium beryllium are not so easy to get because they are very vulnerable to nuclear reactions and you suddenly need this three helium reaction in very quick succession to produce carbon 12 but it does happen we have seen enough lithium beryllium boron so you have a uh, triple alpha process is required to proceed beyond helium so essentially if you have the core of a star or four hydrogen are burning into helium and energy then you have a cool envelope which is largely helium a hydrogen very little bit of helium and then you have the photosphere so as you go into the towards the surface of the star at photosphere you will come across a surface beyond which you cannot see uh, through ordinary optical telescopes and so you have the surface of the star and you have the structure of the star then the so the stars have an equilibrium state um, in which dt by dr the temperature as you go from the center it goes as 1 upon 1 minus gamma gamma is simply gas constant temperature upon pressure and dp by dr so as you go out of the toward the outer from the core of center of the sun as you go outside the rate of change of temperature is dependent on temperature and pressure and uh, the uh, the gradient of pressure so the bigger the star gray, gray, greater is the pressure uh, gradient and therefore higher is the temperature similarly the cp by cv like i said is the gas constant but this equation defines uh, what is the temperature you expect from the star at any location and you find that once you get r to be sufficiently small and the star to be sufficiently large in the core of it nuclear reactions have to be triggered because the pressure and temperatures are now high enough to do that uh and the uh, in case you are wondering where is the gravity in that the gravity of course comes in dp by dr because dp by dr is gm by r square into the density you can think of a thin element of um, spherical element or circular element anywhere along the radius and if it has a density rho then the pressure at that point will given by gm by r square into rho um so you get that pressure of the equation there the other the primary equation that govern the stars are the simple equations so dm by dr at any location the amount of matter is simply 4 pi r square into surface area of that sphere um uh, into the density at that location and the root density of course is a function of radius it is not constant in a star 
then you have equation for hydrostatic equilibrium dp by dr at any given time the inner inward pressure is entirely by gra gravity so essentially you have gmm by r square now coming out as gm inside the star till that radius r and the density at that particular film that you are talking about ah. equation for thermal equilibrium that they uh, d luminosity by dr the amount of light that the star will emit will depend on this epsilon which is um, the amount of energy released per unit mass in terms of um, electromagnetic radiation so it simply uh, again this is a function of radius rho of course is the density which we tell you how much it is uh, the energy transfer dt by dr the temperature changes uh, all now depend on luminosity density and temperature um, and radius of course but there is an additional term called opacity and this opacity is the one that has created a lot of problems in stellar models opacity is the amount of light that a given location will absorb compared to what it will let through so for example wood is completely is kappa equal to 1 it is completely opaque glass will have opacity anywhere between 0 and 1 depending on which wavelength of light you are talking about and uh, what kind of glass you are talking about so if it is plain uh, see through glass then essentially kappa is 0 and you can look right through it so car windshields typically tend to have kappa close as close to zero as possible on the other hand if you are putting it as a decorative piece where people can't see inside then you get glass which is as close to kappa equal to 1 as possible and then all this results like i said in the outermost region there is convection and over there this dt by dr is now proportional to the uh, the gas constants and the mixing rate etc so that you have this convection uh, um, current formation so the star is essentially defined by these parameters and the place where we have struggled in trying to get a perfect model for the stellar structure etc is in this kappa uh, which is difficult to model as well as um, um, epsilon how much energy but that at least epsilon you can model not with too much of difficulty rho you can guess simply as 1 by r square but kappa has been the one that has always been very difficult to model then there are stability time scales so for example if you create a nuclear disturbance in the in a star it takes 10 days to 10 times m sun by l sun come upon l sun by m sun so again nuclear disturbances so if the nuclear reaction rate changes marginally um, or the nuclear time scales of um, amount of material that burns actually is in the a fraction of um, uh, 10 days to 10 times uh, the sun sun say is about 10 billion years on the other end the thermal time scale the amount of time in which energy will pass through the star will depend on the luminosity radius and the mass but is in the time scales of 3 into 10 to 7 years or so so 30 billion years or so 30 million years or so but if you make a dynamical time scale if you, if you sort of disturb the surface of the sun then the dynamic changes are in fact much smaller than even a day it goes as m1 and so and uh, m sun raised to half and r sun r sun upon r is raised to 3 by 2 but essentially 0.04 is the constant and this comes in useful um, when somebody talks about the sun i'm sure they will talk about solar oscillations and this tells you that solar oscillation should die in a matter of minutes if not hours and therefore the how the source of solar um, oscillation etc is a big issue of concern about where it is getting its energy from to keep on continuously bubbling but you have this kind of an equation that governs dynamical time scale when you make minor disturbances on the surface of the star so that is what essentially defines completely the structure of a star and its uh, controlling equations so if you like temperature profile of the star as you go from the center to the surface you essentially have this kind of a feature so the density profile in the core of the sun is very strong or core of a star is very strong and then it falls more or less exponentially towards the edge it is um, it is even faster the density profile on the other end is extremely steep um a gaussian by about 0.2 the density effectively goes from 150 grams per centimeter cube down to about 30 40 grams per centimeter cube by about 0.2 stellar radii so the the, the law, most of the density of the star is located or most of the material in the star in that sense is located in the center if you look at the mass profile of the star you would notice what i'm saying so um, um, 20% of the mass of the uh, 40% of the mass of the sun is within 0.2 radii from the sun and essentially most of the mass is there within 0.6 radii of the sun the outer regions of the of the star do not really have much background of material 
what is happening is happening in the core and similarly if you take the pressure profile the pressure is maximum by about 0.2 solar stellar radii and then it falls very uh, swiftly so the surface the atmospheric pressure is not very steep but if you go to 0.2 um point um, or 20% of the stellar radius the temperature uh, pressure actually becomes uh, significant and because starts becoming really very significant as you go towards the center so you have the basic physics of star in place so let us look at normal stars um two gentlemen uh, called hartsprung and russell decided to look at all the stars and plot them so what they did was they plotted the surface temperature of the star in those days star temperatures were not known precisely so the brightest stars were called o stars then the less bright were called b a f g k m and there is a history to why they are named like that but uh, the, this is the temperature of the star and this is the absolute magnitude how bright does it appear to me and uh, um, this is visual magnitude normalized to as it would be at 10 um, 10 um, Parsec. So you have this temperature against the absolute brightness of the star, and they found that most of the stars that they saw fell on this blue line, and because most of the stars fall over here, they called it the main sequence. And the sun, for example, is on this here. Sorry, the sun is um, over here. This is the sun. The faintest stars are over here. The brightest stars are over here. But essentially, you have um, a blue line where most of the stars fall. and uh, they are called the main sequence stars now of course um, uh, you can figure out that this is where the stars are still in their nascent stage burning hydrogen to helium so these are all main sequence stars which are burning hydrogen to helium when they run out of hydrogen the center of the core of the star obviously cools down because it's not producing any energy there's an imbalance in the pressure and a lot of material comes um, like going into the star the star compresses but as it is compressed it there is also a bounce off effect and that bounce off effect means that the uh, star becomes a giant so once it runs out of hydrogen it goes off this main line it becomes sub giant or giant or even super giant depending on what the original mass was and from there you have um, the star cooling down uh, decaying essentially and we'll come to those details when we talk about death of a star and eventually end up in the dwarf star so the graveyard of the stars is over here so you start on the main sequence depending on what your size and mass is you go through the sequence over here and there are various sub classifications of giants over here but you turn around and come to the dwarf star so this uh, what acha what hartsprung russell started simply as a as a study of where the stars what is the typical absolute brightness and temperature of the star is turns out to be a very good place to start studying the life history of star So, if you look at, for example, O stars are the hottest stars, and um, M stars are the faintest stars. The hottest stars will uh, will primarily have the spectrum from ionized helium. B stars will primarily have emission from neutral helium. Uh, A stars and uh, uh, will have primarily spectrum from hydrogen. Then, uh, for um, for um, cooler stars, hydrogen etc. do not get as ionized as you would like it to be on the surface because. the surface temperature is low between 5 and 30000 degrees kelvin and so you get largely emissions from ionized metal and at even cooler stars you get um, neutral metals and in really cool stars at the edge of star formation you get much uh, light from uh, molecular uh, dissociation so even if the core in each case is um, hot what you get eventually at the surface will depend on what the surface temperature of the star is and then you can ask how many of which kinds of stars are there so what i have here is spectrum of various stars the blue star is the hottest as you can imagine from planck curve while the red stars are over here the red, uh, red stars uh, the planck uh, the planck curve has in actually peaked somewhere in infrared and has already started going down and so on so if you take this brightest of the hottest stars in the universe you call them o, star, o type stars typical temperature is more than 30000 degrees kelvin uh, they are apparently blue in color They they tend to be 16 times as heavy as the sun. Uh, radius is only about six times the radius of the sun, or seven times the radius of the sun. Luminosity is about 30 times that, 30,000 times that of the sun. So they are really bright. The hydrogen line is weak because uh, hydrogen is essentially fully ionized in this case. And then the amount of fraction of number of stars of that kind that exists in the universe is only about 0.003 percent. Of the total number of stars are O-type stars of this hot variety. 
D type stars on the other end tem have temperature of 10 to 30,000 degrees Kelvin. They are typically bluish white, somewhere like this, and they tend to be uh, twice to 16 times the size of the sun. The radius can be 1.8 to 6.6 .6 times the size of the sun. And then you have luminosity, which is about 25 to 30,000 times bigger than the sun. The hydrogen lines are slightly stronger at medium level over here, and 0.13% of the stars in the universe are of this variety. If you take A-type stars, temperatures of 7,500 to 10,000 degrees Kelvin, they typically tend to be blue to blue white somewhere over here, greenish and so on. Um, the mass can be 1.4 to 2.1 times the size of the mass of the sun. Uh, the radius can be 1.4 to 1.8 times the radius of the sun. Luminosity can be 5 to 25 times as bright as the sun. And this one has the strong um, hydrogen lines because this is where the hydrogen is ionized and dia, um, new, made neutral very quickly and so you get very strong hydrogen line emission over here and so you can see that over here in these stars and then they are uh, these the stars sorry and then they are 0.6 percent of the stars in the universe f type star 6000 uh, to 7500 degrees uh, kelvin they appear whitish in color um, which is over here and they have got the star mass which is slightly more than the sun, 1.04 to 1.4 solar masses. The radius can be one, about 10 to 20 percent bigger than or 10 to 40 percent bigger than that of the sun. Luminosity can be 1.5 to 5 times, but now the temperature is not high enough to excite hydrogen, so you get only medium emission from hydrogen lines. And three percent of the stars in the universe are, hydro, are this kind. G, which is the classification to which sun belongs. The temperature can be 5,200 to 5,000 uh, to 6,000 degrees Kelvin. These are yellowish white. Sun is a yellowish white star. The radius, as you can imagine, is around one solar radius plus minus 20 percent. Um, then you have um, the radius. Typically, is solar radius. The luminosity is similar to solar luminosity. The hydrogen now is not excited enough in the atmosphere, so the hydrogen lines are weak. And about 8% of the stars in the universe belong to this category. And then you have K-type stars, have, all the numbers are smaller than the previous case, and they account for about 12% of the stars in the sky. But most stars in the universe are M-type, cooler than 3600 degrees Kelvin, temperature of about um, um, te uh, temperature about 3700, orange is red in color, the size half the size of the sun which is the limiting value. If you go significantly below this, the star nuclear reactions will not be triggered. The radius tends to be about 70% of the radius of the sun. Luminosity similarly is just 8% of the luminosity of the sun because most of the emission is now in the infrared. And the hydrogen lines are very, very weak because hydrogen remains electrically neutral. But 76% of the stars in the universe are of M type. So um, the star, for, um, um, the number of stars as a function of mass actually follows a fairly um, interesting uh, shape because most of the stars are actually in a very low mass and the higher the mass, the smaller the number of stars. And I'll come to mass function in a minute. Typically what happens to a star is that it is on the main sequence and I already told you what the main, main sequence is. When the stars, when the star first gets ignited and started, we call it zero age main sequence star. So the age is zero and it is a main sequence star. So zero age main sequence star is over here, ZAMS. As the star uh, goes through nuclear reactions, finishes hydrogen, etc., uh, it starts going off this line and then eventually as it, um, as it goes through, it becomes a uh, hotter and brighter because now helium burning happens and the star has also gone into giant stays and eventually it will co uh, become cool, dark and the molecular cloud and essentially the star will die. The bigger stars are more dynamic. So this is the mass, um, uh, the mass luminosity relation for stars. So you have mass over here at 0.4 you just about have the star formation all the way to about 16 or 20 solar masses and y axis is the luminosity. So the sun at one solar mass and uh, luminosity of one because this is in the units of the mass of the sun. And then the, ma the mass increases and the luminosity of the star also increases. And it, it cannot be easily fitted with an equation. So there is a linear equation fitting here, linear equation fitting over here. And that is how you estimate the mass energy, mass luminosity relation for stars. 
then so so that is what a young star and stars beginning looks like then let us look at aging stars it there, there's a very peculiar problem like i said the stars burn by burning hydrogen into helium and then when it runs out of helium helium become it starts burning helium into carbon carbon into nitrogen etc and each time it burns it the nucleus that you get is is stronger more tightly bound nucleus than the previous one and so you get energy release so hydrogen to helium produces certain amount of energy helium to um, carbon produces certain amount of energy carbon to nitrogen produces energy carbon to oxygen produces energy and so on until you come to nay iron iron nucleus is the most tightly bound nucleus you know beyond that um, um, nickel and all are elements whose whose um, nuclei are not as tightly bound as that of iron so when you start producing nickel from iron you no longer get energy release so let me explain this on the x axis you have the mass number of a nucleus so uh for example uranium uranium at 292 will come somewhere over here 250 lead etc will come over here and uh, iron at 26 comes over here with its 15 nuclei um, iron 26 is 26 protons and 26 nuclei and so 52 and so on so iron comes here and what you have is the binding energy the stronger this value the tighter is the nucleus binding so hydrogen of course is unbound but helium is one of the most tightly bound nuclei we know then lithium beryllium boron are not very tightly bound and that is why you have this nuclear react they are vulnerable to nuclear reactions and then after lithium beryllium boron you start going carbon nitrogen oxygen neon etc all the way up to iron at iron this value reaches the maximum and beyond that all reactions to produce heavy elements are actually endothermic they absorb the heat and therefore they cannot keep a star running so you can imagine in the core of the star you started burning hydrogen to helium helium to nitrogen nitrogen to ox uh, oxygen and so on and when you start burning iron to produce nickel instead of heat keeping the heat going iron actually absorbs the heat so iron actually is a poison to the core of the star because it more or less stops the nuclear reactions and because it stops the nuclear reactions the pressure from the gas is still um, unflinching and so the star goes into a very peculiar state where it is compressed heavily and also bounces off the hard core surface and you get uh, interesting features but essentially so if you look at a middle aged star of like the sun which is a very small star uh, you have hydrogen burning at the core and non burning envelope where conduction etc of heat is happening as the star ages at the hydrogen burn high it runs out of hydrogen fuel in the in the center and therefore helium burns to carbon in the outer region where the temperatures are a little lower and the densities are lower you uh, little lower whatever hydrogen still remains still continues to burn in helium and then you have a non burning envelope outside a light larger star as it further um, uh, sort of burns then it will start um, now runs out of one it will run out of helium at some stage and then you will have carbon burning to sodium neon and magnesium in the outer region you will still have helium burning to carbon in the outermost region you will have hydrogen burning to helium and a non burning envelope So essentially, you have an onion skin structure. As you go, um, as the star becomes bigger and older and goes off the main sequence, you get all kinds of um, of um, star, star structures in the center. So in the center, for example, in a giant star, which is way out of the main sequence, you will have a degenerate iron core in the middle, and then sulfur and silicon will burn to iron, oxygen will burn to silicon. a uh, sulfur and silicon neon will burn to oxygen and magnesium carbon will burn to sodium magnesium and magnesium helium will burn to carbon in the center hydrogen will burn to helium and then you will have a non burning envelope you will have layered reactions of various uh, elements depending uh, on how much remains so just to yes. your slide has again gone can you uh, just now you can't see my slide yeah it has it is not it is shared but it has become yeah, yeah okay okay it has come yeah okay you got it right yeah okay um so when a star runs out of fuel this is what happens uh so this is the sun type star and this is the, the sun star becomes a giant because the hard inner core is very strong and so as the gas pressure comes in the star essentially bounces and becomes fatter and therefore if you take a sun like star it is roughly this size a giant star will comparatively be much bigger so you have here a comparison of the star compared to the sun um uh, compared to the earth for example so you have a um, star over here you have its convection which looks very similar but inside now the core is burning various other elements 
So this is what you have for the sun, the core, the radiative zone, and then the convection zone in the photosphere. For red giant, uh, the, the burning coast uh, in the center is not very large, but the convective zone now is much bigger and the star itself is bloated. So when the star runs out of hydrogen um, and uh, burn, they no longer produce the heat that is coming in. And so the star swells up um, as it goes off the main sequence star. So the surest signature of a star going off main sequence is that it bloats up. And it becomes a giant, sub-giant or giant depending on what it is. To give you an example, an M-type star looks, these are all main sequence star, an M-type star to O-type star, uh, even on main sequence will be so much different. The sun, like I said, is over here. And you can see that in the table I had shown you about the radius being 6 to what? 6, how many times? Some 6 to 30 times I had said uh, here. The radius is more than seven times the radius of the sun, and that number can be really large when it goes main sequence. So even on main sequence, an O-type stars will be about seven times as big as the sun, but smaller stars will be smaller. But the, the fun is there when the stars become giant. So here I have a scale. The sun is over here. The Jupiter is just one pixel over here. The sun is over here. Compared to sun Sirius, which is still on the main sequence burning hydrogen, a white colored star, temperature of 30, 25,000 degrees Kelvin, will look so much bigger. But Pollux, which is a giant, looks even bigger. And Arcturus, which is a giant, looks even much, much bigger. How much bigger it looks? It can fix 16 suns in the center of its disk. Just along the equatorial line, you will have 16 suns that can fit into the center of Arcturus. But Arcturus is certainly not the biggest. If you take sun as one pixel, Arcturus fits over here, Rigel fits over here, Aldebaran is over here. Betelgeuse is over here and Antares is this big. How big is Antares? Antares is big enough to take 700 suns on its diameter. How big is 700 diameter of the sun? The 1 AU distance between the earth and the sun compounds to this much. Essentially the entire solar system up to Jupiter will fit in the center of this star. The stars can be that big. And in fact Antares is not the biggest. If you look at uh, the size scales, uh, then you get Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Ma Mercury, uh, Mars, Venus, and the Earth. And then compare that with higher planet, Earth will be over here, Jupiter, uh, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. And then if you take Jupiter as your measure, then there is another star called Wolf 359, which is an M-type star. And then you have the Sun, which looks this big, and Sirius looks even much bigger than that, six times the size of the Sun. And if you go take even Sirius as your as your small point, then Pollux is this big, and Taurus is big, this, and Aldebaran is even bigger. But even then, it, things go on to continue. So if you take Aldebaran as so small, then you get Rigel, which is over here, but Betelgeuse is over here, and Antares is even bigger than Betelgeuse. And if you take Antares now as your standard, then S Dora Doradus is even bigger. K Y Gar Cygni is even bigger and V V C P is one of the biggest stars we know. So clearly, if the sun is a normal star, Aldebaran is a giant, but uh, V V C P is certainly a super giant. So you can have really, really, really large stars, and the way they come, of course, is, is that they are degenerate. So you have um, um, the hydrogen line, uh, the main sequence line over here, and what I have here is the lines which define the line and age sequence of each star. And these are called Hayashi lines because they tell you how the star will be. So let us still look at the sun. When the sun runs out of hydrogen, it will essentially go through this collapse and bouncing, which means its temper, which its, its brightness will increase initially. But then as the, as the it starts in uh, settling down into helium burning, uh, its um, luminosity will remain constant, but the temperature will appear lower because now it is a giant, so it has cooled a little more. And then eventually it will become brighter and brighter as a giant because it becomes a huge giant. But it is burning heavier elements and essentially the sun will die somewhere over here. If you take a star that is 2.25 times the size of the sun, then actually it makes a very sharp turn over here, becoming much brighter suddenly um, and having higher temperatures. And then eventually follows this line. Just to repeat on the x-axis, I have temperature in reverse order. So it is 50,000 degrees Kelvin over here and it is... Uh, what, less than 5,000 degrees, uh, 3,000 degrees, 3,500 degrees Kelvin, which is the minimum temperature for a star. And on the y-axis, you have the luminosity. Uh, 10 raised to minus 1, the luminosity of the sun, 1, lumi one times the sun, luminosity of the sun, 10 times the luminosity of the sun, and so on. So the sun, of course, at once, one luminosity and uh, 5,000 some degrees Kelvin, 
sits over here. But if you take a three, so uh, if you take, for example, a nine solar mass star, or even if you take a say six, eight solar mass star, it will burn, go towards the edge. Then for a little while, its temperature will appear to increase. Its luminosity will be marginally more. But then eventually, it will cool very swiftly over a long period of time, and then go over to becoming a red giant. And over in red giant phase also, it will sort of oscillate here between various temperatures and surfaces depending on how nuclear reactions are occurring. I don't think you'll be able to see the slide very carefully because otherwise there are numbers given over here about how long it stays in which stage. And that I will come to in detail for one specific example. So if you look at the sun, for example, the sun is 4.5 billion years old right now, very much on the main sequence burning hydrogen to helium. 12 billion years from now, it will be in this stage over here in a giant stage uh, towards becoming a red giant in 12.2 billion years. And from that red uh, red giant, it will cool on to go on to become a yellow giant as the core temperature becomes hotter. And then from yellow giant, it will eventually rise all the way to become much cooler, much, much brighter uh, at four, a thousand times its current luminosity. At that stage, it will start cooling. So the temperature will become higher as more and more of the core becomes visible. And then eventually, as the core is completely exposed and no more no nuclear reactions remain, the star will come down and die over here as a white dwarf. If you had a, high, a heavier star, you can imagine now from the previous diagram that will go to much higher level. But essentially, after going through that higher level, it will eventually turn around and come over here. So this is the graveyard of stars. So the sun will be in the main sequence for about 9 billion years. It will remain red giant for about a billion more years. Then it will remain a yellow giant for about 100 million years. And eventually, in 10,000 uh, 10, years, it will emit a lot of its material through a puffing effect, I will show you an example of that, that we call a planetary nebula. Eventually, it will become a white dwarf and then cool down to nothing in particular and become a black body of dead matter. Uh, so that is the general history of stars. But all stars are not that stable. And at various stages of their lifetime, they can also be unstable. So while they are on the main sequence, they tend to be stable. Um, when they are not on main sequence, they, are, they can be unstable. So there are the stars that are uh, intrinsically unstable or for external reasons unstable. If there are external reasons unstable, obviously they have a companion. So either they have an eclipsing variable or a rotating variable, which means that the brightness seems to occur, change. But these are extrinsic reasons. There is another companion they have, binary. But intrinsically varying stars can be of two kinds. One is the pulsating stars. Where what happens is that the inner pressure and uh, the outer radiation are not fully uh, synchronized. So every time the star is pushed inside, the nuclear reactions occur. And as the nuclear reaction occurs, the radiation pressure goes out and the star bounces. And um, you don't see the bounce. What you see is increase and um, uh, decrease in the brightness. So you call them pulsating stars. Amongst these pulsating times, the most famous are Seifert's. And the reason why Seifert stars are so famous is because Seifert stars have an interesting relation that the amount of change in their brightness depends, you know, depends on the period of their oscillations. A Seifert that, that oscillates very quickly will be a much smaller mass than a Seifert that um, collapses and rises very gradually. And because it is a pulsating effect, the light curve is very characteristic. So by looking at a variable star light characteristic, you can see if it is a Seifert. And if it's a Seifert, then if uh, then by the by knowing the period of its oscillation, I know how bright that star intrinsically is. And if I know how bright that star intrinsically is, and I know how bright it appears to me, that ratio will give me the distance. So this Seifert and Lyra, uh, RR Lyra in particular are stars that have been typically used as distance measure. The standard candles to measure distances to various objects in the universe. But Seifert and RR Lyra are particularly good for this. T tau, RV Tauri also has the relation, but not very strong. Then there are long period variables called Mira variables and semi regulars. And then there are er 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 eruptive variables, which simply explode. Supernova is an extreme example. I will come to it towards the end. The planetary nebula, no way that I told you come somewhere over here. Then there are recurring nova as the star sort of goes through various pulsating explosions. It has a recurrent nova. Then there are dwarf novas. If the star is really small, the red giant phase is not very significant, <coughs> and you get a dwarf nova. And then there are symbiotic, symbiotic stars, where the two stars are practically at their surfaces touching each other. And that symbiotic relation means that material keeps getting transferred between the two stars. 
and you have a kind of um, oscillating behavior, eruptive behavior every time mass is dumped into the other. And then you have our corona borealis kind of stars, which are also eruptive in nature. So there is one main sequence like stars which explodes and so on. And then there are intrinsic, extrinsic variables I already explained. This is what a planetary nebula looks like. So you actually have the star in the middle and you have puffed out material typically. So for example, if this was sun, the solar, the earth's radius would be less than the width of this laser pointer. And uh, Jupiter and Saturn would fit into somewhere well within this. So the planetary nebulas can be quite large. And these knots can then coalesce into becoming cometary material or uh, interstellar dust or whatever you wanted. But essentially, a typical um, nebula, um, helix nebula is in this case, is a planetary nebula that looks like this. These are rarely a low resolution images of the same object. Now with better telescopes and Hubble and so on, we have a much better images. And of course, uh, James Webb will change it even more. Then there is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is interesting because in January 2019, it looked like this. In December 2019, it looked like this. And its intensity has been changing. So you have September 2019 to March 2020. And you can see that the intensity of its light is actually varying and unstable. Betelgeuse is even by um, red giant's phase is towards the end of its red giant phase. Sooner or later, it will go into explode into a supernova and then it will go down to becoming a pulsar. But soon by astronomical standard means that over the next 100,000 years, sometime it will explode. But we, we presume that uh, Betelgeuse is on its now its way towards the end of its red giant phase and will soon explode into um, um, unusual objects. And I'll come to that in a minute. Its visual magnitude you can see was um, uh, um, 0.4, so, um, um, it was 0.6 magnitude, it has gone all the way down to 1.8 magnitude. In astronomy, the magnitudes work reverse. The higher the magnitude, the fainter the star. So this has now become 1.8 magnitude, it is still visible to naked eye, but not as look does not look as spectacular as it did when it was 0.6 um, visual magnitude. Then the stars die. When they run out of all the, everything, including up to iron, they essentially the stars die. And Chandrasekhar for the first time worked out saying that classical physics uh, equations for how where the star goes, uh, where its death is not good enough. So Chandrasekhar calculated. He said if you take non-relativistic classical term, um, treatment, then the star, then a star would look like this. But at this stage, because the um, density is very high and the nature of material is very different, you should actually use a relativistic Fermi gas approximation for what happens in the center of the star. And if you do that, essentially the star dies at 1.4 uh, solar masses, um, its radi radius becomes really, really very small and therefore it becomes an unusually compact object. So he called these things degenerate objects, objects which have uh, which have uh, at ultraviolet relativistic limits, the, velocity, the radii are very, very small and they become very strange objects. But so non, till then, non-relativistic classical Fermi gas equations were the ones that were being solved and people didn't think much of it. But Chandrasekhar was to change that completely and that is why he got his Nobel Prize that if you use relativistic Fermi gas, then you will have a very unusual object beyond 1.4 solar masses. And this is called the Chandrasekhar mass limit. Beyond 1.44 solar masses, you get a degenerate objects, objects that are not in normal state of matter. This is an example of a supernova. So this is supernova 1987A. Before the star exploded, it looked like this. And after it exploded, it looked like this. And you can see that it has completely overwhelmed its neighborhood regions. And uh, it is essentially now a giant um, star. And so, and uh, um, over a period of a few days, the apparent magnitude of the star will increase by something like 12 or 14 orders of magnitude. It is 20, typical stellar uh, intensity is 10 to 26 orgs per second. It can go from 26 orgs to 10 to 34 orgs or so. It can overwhelm a galaxy completely. It can look that bright at a distance. And here you can see 87A, how much brighter it has become. This is what the uh, residue of a supernova will look like. It is Cassiopeiae in this case. The colors are temperature coordinated. So the red color is 20 million degrees Kelvin. The blue color is um, 30 million degrees Kelvin and the yellow color is lesser. And you can see that the supernova actually is not homogeneous at all. 
there are some region where there is lots of light being emitted at low temperature there are some region where lots of light is emitted at high temperature and the whole thing is uneven so that when while we lock to talk about stars we talk them talk about them as a homogeneous spherical shape they are really not homogeneous spherical shape this is an example this is the light curve that we got from supernova 1987 So what you have in this red color is the overall spectra, overall uh, light intensity as a function of time. So you have a uh, thousand days after explosion, two thousand days, three thousand days, four thousand days. So this is 1987A is here. This is our uh, two years after 1987A, two and a half years. This is ten years after the, um, the explosion and so on. And the light curve of that star, you can see it was at the brightest about 10 to 38 ergs, and it has gone the way all the way down to 10 to 36 ergs in a matter of four thousand days. But if you do spectroscopy and look for specific wavelength, then you have this cobalt line, which started, uh, which accounted for most of the emission from the star in the beginning, but which decays very quickly because cobalt fifty six burns into heavier elements. Cobalt fifty seven line starts from somewhere um, um, uh, about a hundred times weaker, but eventually by about one thousand six hundred two hundred days, it actually outshines cobalt sixteen. It is brighter in cobalt fifty seven than cobalt fifty six because a lot of the six is being burnt into seven. Titanium, on the other hand, does not contribute much initially, but eventually that becomes the dominant uh, light uh, source of light in the star because a lot of nucleosynthesis will end up at titanium, and therefore titanium will be produced. Um, similarly, if you take um, 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 sodium, dies out over here, but cobalt dies out over here. So you can see when an exploding supernova, you can actually see the nuclear reaction that we. we had postulated happen at the core of the star you can because it is a naked star the core is now exposed uh, it will result in the death of the star but while it is dying it will tell you about the kind of nuclear reaction that are going on and this agree well agrees well with our predictions of what supernova nucleosynthesis should look like it also has um, if you take cassiopeia's uh, spectrum you can also see this emission lines of silicon sulfur argon calcium and iron And um, the burning of these neon magnesium oxide are over here, but you can actually see emission and absorption lines uh, of these elements at very high temperature. This is um, in kV, so this is one kV temperature, and so on. If you look at Cassiopeia in different, if you take it in a composite image, it looks like this. But if you ask how much silicon is there, because you can look at it in the silicon wavelength, <coughs> you will notice that the silicon is largely on one side. calcium on the other end is highly nebulous and highly localized and iron as you can imagine is even more localized and even more nebulized over here so silicon is still um, um fairly low in z and therefore it produces it is producing larger quantities and therefore it is uniformly found everywhere but iron which is the last product of stellar nucleosynthesis actually is in very small quantities because it has essentially killed the star you can see it in clusters This is the Cassiopeia composite image, um, various temperatures and so on, and various emission lines, and you can see how structured it is. Including, you can see the structure of a material that is being pouring out, like that finger in the supernova remnant that I showed you very early in the lecture, where um, this um, so-called fingers of creations happen. So essentially, what happens when a star dies when it runs out of high its nucleosynthesis is that if it is a small star like the Sun. it becomes a red giant becomes a planetary nebula becomes a white dwarf because of its temperature which will eventually cool into brown dwarf and um, black dwarfs essentially these are invisible objects a larger star will become a red giant and as it becomes a red giant uh, it will go into a supernova explosion and as it goes into supernova explosion if the mass is between 3 and 5 solar masses then you the residual material you will have will be a neutron star and i'll come to what is a neutron star in a minute or it can if it the star is original star is much brighter then it is 3 to 5 solar masses uh, then you what you get in the residue is a very peculiar object that we call black hole and i'll come to black holes in a minute essentially what is happening is that when the star dies the core of the material gets really really heavily pressed so if you take a star that is 3 to 5 times the size of the sun and the residue is more as uh, around 1.4 solar masses the pressure balance is such that you can make a nucleus of z equal to hundreds of trillions and this can be stable so for a medium size star 3 to 5 solar masses you essentially get one gigantic nucleus of z equal to whatever hundreds of trillions and this is a stable configuration and it's and i will come i'll discuss neutron stars separately in a minute but if the if the star is greater than 3 to 5 solar masses then the pressure 
on the core is so much that not even nuclear forces will stand up and you get a very peculiar object that we will for the time being label it as black hole but we will come to it detail in a minute in a little while <coughs> the main difference between a neutron star and a black hole is that the neutron star has a visible surface so when material or anything falls on it or if something happens to the surface what happens can be seen by the world a black hole has no surface and i will come to those dynamics a little later but essentially because a black hole has no surface anything that goes in goes in forever and you can never see it again so that is the primary difference between a neutron star and a black hole this is what i wanted to tell you in detail about um, what happens to a star this is supernova 1987a it became a supernova on february 23 1987a as we saw it but the star was born 11 million bc when apes were just emerging on earth it was on the main sequence so this is the hydrogen burning main sequence of that star it was a 18 solar mass star that began its life 11 million years ago it remained in that main sequence age for a long time and about 700000 years ago uh, it uh, its hydrogen burning got exhausted and it went into major minor brightness and nitrogen um, um, carbon and nitrogen burning happened and that nitrogen burning took it to becoming a giant and gradually building up over here by the time it reached this stage now the nuclear burning um, um, dynamics had changed the star was unstable and so it became a seaford variable so it remained a seaford variable for some time um, uh, before it eventually became the red giant that a uh, 80 solar mass star is expected to be so starting with 700000 years when it finished with its hydrogen burning and another 50000 years it becomes a red giant a helium burning red giant marginally surviving for a little while from some 50000 years or so by burning nitrogen and carbon and so on but eventually it becomes a, a super red giant so red super giant by about 700000 50000 years ago human beings at that time were just about beginning to learn how to make fire so homo erectus was on the earth at about 700000 years ago and by the time the star became a uh, red super giant human beings are just about learning to uh how to control fire and how to make tools at this stage it was 1.2 solar masses were lost due to winds and um, outer material um, loss and to give you an idea about what that giant meant it meant that the entire uh, uh, orbit of the earth would have fitted into the star and i showed you other star examples of like that jupiter would have been just about outside mars also would have been fitted into this and that super giant phase it doesn't it lasts for about 600000 years 45000 bc when homo sapiens were now beginning to take over the earth the core helium burning was exhausted and now carbon burning had to start so the star goes through a, a quick compression from the super red giant stage all the way down to a stage where its temperature now is 15 18 19 1000 degrees kelvin its luminosity is still comparable but this is when carbon burning starts just as human beings were learning agriculture on earth carbon burning started on the star about 10000 years ago then carbon burning runs in, out very quickly and it becomes a pre supernova star at about 10000 years and in the final phases for example in 1971 it started burning neon um, into higher elements in 83 it ignited oxygen in 1987 it ignited silicon burning and in 1987 within 10 days it went into a supernova explosion so essentially star uh, the star lived for 11 million years but its last stages of burning heavier elements was a matter of few years few tens of years at the most 17 to 87 is 16 years or so so from here uh, from carbon burning to the death of the star is actually a fairly short Time scale, but this is what we believe is happening to. For example, Betelgeuse, we believe is somewhere over here. But this is what happened to supernova that star that we now know as supernova 1987A. It went through like this, and eventually it produced a, a, a black hole. A neutron star would look like this. So a neutron star, the size of the sun, would be about 20 kilometers in diameter. its uh, outermost atmosphere would be super hot plasma at temperatures of few, few million degrees kelvin which would consist of essentially protons and electrons and neutrons just free running um on these objects there is a crust at the middle 
which actually is very sensitive to impact so if something falls on it or if there is a there is a spurt in nuclear reactions you can actually have star quakes on these objects as as, as uh, just like you have earthquake on earth so you can get star quakes on this outer crust um, about 200 meters deep uh, when nuclear and electron on the surface if you go inside you can have inner crust where also you can get star quakes but now that let it tends to be a nuclear lattice about a kilometer deep when nuclear electrons and neutrons form a crystalline structure which gives you the inner level side uh, structure but the innermost level of the the, the second level, uh, mo- innermost level of the star now consists of outer core which is atomic particle fluid so essentially all proton neutrons are all mixed together in a fluid and the innermost core is where the the the, co- the region is so compact that even nuclear single individual nuclear formation doesn't happen and you get one gigantic um, quark gluon plasma that controls the central behavior of this object highly conducting high temperature object which means it has a very strong magnetic field <coughs> to give you an idea about how black how small the black um, neutron star is here i have a picture of the cochin region um ba 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 so regional science center sits in the middle of this picture over here at kasari kalikat region kalikat uh, regional science center sits over here and you can probably identify some of this um, regions in kalikat around the science center and the neutron star the size of a sun would fit nicely into this about this size that is how small the neutron star can be because the neutron star is now highly conducting it has sort of compressed from a one solar mass or 1.4 solar masses down onto this small objects of one 20 kilometers or so its magnetic field can be very strong so because it has magnetic field very strong as is in the case of the earth it will have aurora corona borealis and corona australis on earth with a field of 0.3 gauss you have aurora corona corona sorry aurora borealis of the northern lights and aurora australis in the southern lights in the northern and southernmost regions you can imagine what spectacular corona uh, borealis you will get from a neutron star the magnetic fields can be as high as 10 days to 6 to 10 days to 8 gauss compared to earth's magnetic field of 0.3 gauss and compared to the sun's magnetic field of 1 gauss this is eight orders of magnitude higher and the rotational axis of the star need not coincide with the magnetic field So if you are looking at this star from a distance, occasionally you will see the corona borealis, and occasionally you will see corona australis. So essentially, you will have this beaming effect or the lighthouse effect. So when the neutron stars were first seen, people thought people called them pulsars because they were pulsating, and people thought that they were great lighthouses set up by great civilizations. It turned out that the whole thing is a little more mundane. It is just a neutron star that is spinning at an angle compared to its magnetic field, and that is why it has this beaming effect. The beaming, as you can imagine, the further closer you go, you get beaming in gamma rays, outer region you get beaming in X rays, and in the outermost region you get beaming in uh, in radio waves. And the neutron star magnetic fields can look like this, and at the at the core where the material is actually being targeted and point plucked on the surface of the neutron stars. you will get this polar cap and um, you will get material falling into the pulsar and gamma rays being released so if you look at the light uh, and if you, if you look at the sizes of uh, neutron stars almost every neutron star that we know fits into this 1.4 solar masses prediction of of um, chandrasekhar so if you take x ray x ray and optical binaries 1.4 solar masses is a standard if you take binary the double neutron star binaries then the bias is tend to be even lower but by and large they will fit into this uh, 1.4 solar mass uh, as you would expect and this is what the light curve of the neutron star would look like this is the various neutron star so crab pi psr uh, b1509 58 vela psr so and so etc are are the names of um, uh, neutron stars and generally when uh, not generally in astronomy when you see a number like this associated with something it means it's a pulsar catalog Uh, b the second pulsar catalog in which this star is located at 15 hours 9 minutes uh, um, in ra and minus 58 in declination this is located at 19 hours 51 minutes in ra and plus 32 degrees in uh, uh, declination and so on now if you look at crab in uh, this is gamma ray emission x ray emission optical emission and radio emission in in crab uh, and this data is folded for one rotation of the star 
So the crab rotates once in 33 milliseconds. Uh, PSR 1509 rotates once in 150 seconds. Villa rotates once in 89 milliseconds and so on. So this data is folded. When you do that, you in, in crab you can see very beautiful pulse at radio wavelengths. You can also see a very nice pulse in gamma rays. You can see a good pulse even in optical and also in radio you can see this pulse. But if you look at PSR 1905, for some reason the optical wavelength data is missing. When you look at it, you don't just see it. And and um, the X-ray data is also very very fudgy and so also is the data in X-ray gamma ray. On the other end, the radio pulse is seen very nicely in the, uh, the first pulse in the aurora austria. So this is, just to repeat, is aurora uh, borealis and aurora australis. This comes from one pole and this comes from the other. So in, in uh, radio, you can see one pole in X-ray and gamma ray, you can see second pole and you can see nothing in optical. Essentially, what it means is the cloud of material that is covering this neutron pulsar or neutron stars is such that the optical light is all absorbed. In crab, again, you can see both Australia, Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis. In Vela, they look a little different. The radio pulsar, in fact, is a, is a much shorter level. Optical, you can see pul two pulses very close to each other. In X-rays, you just get one broad hump, but in gamma rays, the two pulses are seen very clearly. Generally, because gamma rays come from closest from the surface of the star, they tend to be much more ordered. As the material goes out, then it gets diffused, the radiation gets diffused depending on what the interstellar environment of the star is. PSR 1906 similarly shows you aurora borealis, but doesn't show you aurora australis, which you can only see in gamma rays, and so on and so forth. So pulsars, um, though uh, they will emit in all kinds of wavelengths. Gamma rays come from the core and the radio beam comes from here and the other wavelengths from in between. Um, depending on what the environment around the black neutron star is, you can get the emission in different wavelengths. And this is what we believe is the is a good picture of a beaming uh, pulsar. Then there are black holes. What are black holes? When the object at the center of an exploding star uh, so is subject to pressure so high that not nor even normal material cannot withstand, you end up with a, with an object that as far as our physics goes, tells us that it is zero volume and um, infinite density and zero volume, whatever that means. We don't we are not even sure what it means. But what it means is a very strange thing. That from the surface of such an object, the escape velocity is more than velocity of light. So not even light can escape from this object. And when we see something we see from light, in these objects not even light will be seen, so essentially that object will never be seen, so we call it a black hole. It's an object that we can never see. But even for the example, even on Earth, the escape velocity from the surface of the Earth is 11 kilometers per second. But if, as you go further away from the Earth, the escape velocity keeps on going down. So even in a black hole, even if the inside of the black hole, the escape velocity is greater than velocity of light, you can keep on coming outside where you will reach at one level where the escape velocity is, slight, is equal to or less than the velocity of light. From that location, light can escape. And that region is called the event horizon or short side radius from beyond which you can actually see things happening. Inside the, the event horizon, you cannot see anything. So event horizon is conventionally also defined as the radius of the black hole. Because inside that is a black box, we have no clue what is happening. But the outside regions can be seen, so it is called event horizon. So matter close to the, so when the, when the matter is falling into this black hole, sometimes what happens is that matter that is falling in, can bump off some other piece of mat material and give it enough velocity to escape. So in the dynamics of the region around a black hole, the material that is falling in, part of it will fall inside, but part of it will pick up enough energy to have escape velocity and that will escape from the black hole. But because the rotation, uh, the, the space time is typed up uh, very tightly and I will come to that in a minute, but essentially the rotational velocity is so high that the black, that the material that comes out from this black holes, from the material that is falling into this black hole, the outcome will be essentially in the form of jets along the poles of the stars. So they are equivalent to Corona or Borealis and Corona Australis of a black hole, except that these jets are very, very strong. So you have a black hole over here, you have torus of material from which or a meduvada from which material is falling into this black hole. And as it falls into the black hole, some of the falling material give you enough velocity to escape and that will escape along the radial axis of the star, rotational axis of the star 
and so you will have these two spectacular chairs and uh, people wondering what the disc about this meduvada looks like and we believe that meduvada has fairly ordered uh, magnetic field within the black hole and i'll show you an example of that and it is not turbulent as you used to think but it is essentially fairly well ordered uh, this accretion means falling into so the accretion disk is disk from which material is falling into the black hole so you can get this supermassive black holes i'll come to in a minute so essentially you have jets and as the black hole rotates in this case is rotating like this so, so this light is blue shifted this light uh, light is red shifted and you have these jets coming out of it and from these jets obviously are very high energy so you get gamma rays electrons coming out all the way x rays and gamma rays that come out from jets and you can see these jets even from galaxies M87 um, galaxy, you can see the jet uh, beautifully coming out from the center of the black hole. Uh, C, 3C279 is an object within our own galaxy, um, and these are the observations made in the year 1992, 93, 94, 95, and so on, where you can see material coming out from the center of the star in the form of jets. So, this is the jet coming from 3C279. And if you look at 3C279 in, in a little detail, this is what you will see at 100 microseconds. This is we will see at 250 microsecond, a um, micro arc second, high resolution images. And if you do a really high, very high resolution image, you get this black hole over here and the material that is being thrown out um, in the form of blobs or in the form of jet in this over here. And so these jets come out. They may not be continuous stream of particles because it depends on how the black hole is being felt by the accretion disk. So you have the black hole, you have the accretion disk and the material being thrown along the jet and these jets will have helical magnetic field plus a lot of gap blobs of gas that you can see as I showed you in the previous pictures. These are blobs of gas that are coming out from that uh, from the accretion disk of the black hole. Uh, the black holes can, uh, we know that center of all galaxies have a black hole and they typically tend to be a million times the size of the sun. They can be anything from a million to a billion times a million to a thousand million times the black hole in our own galaxy. The, gal the black hole in our own galaxy is a million times um, bigger than the sun or heavier than the sun. And this is the jet that is coming out from a whole galaxy. The galaxy is Centaurus A and you can see that material is being shot out from it. And when you think about it and look at crab, which is a few solar masses, you can actually see that the jets look very similar. And the reason why they look similar is because the physics is the same. So supermassive black holes are eating up now whole galaxies and producing jets which are typically few light second, light years apart. While um, 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 while in case of a black hole in our own galaxy, it is simply eating up material from uh, from the neighboring star and therefore it produces jets which are much weaker. But the physics is the same. You get material falling in, some of it will pick up escape velocity and go in. But because the material falling in the energy budget and the amount of material available is very small, a black hole in our galaxy will have a jet which is typically a few light years across. And originally when these objects were seen, they were seen to be as bright as a star, but as, as large as a galaxy. So they are called quasars, quasi-stellar objects, star-like uh, star -like objects which are uh, brighter than a galaxy. And we now know that they are black holes. So when there are gigantic black holes in the center of our galaxy, they are eating up the whole galaxy. The energy budget is much higher. And therefore, this jet can go up to a few millions of uh, light years compared to a light year uh, for, a, for a black hole within our galaxy. These black holes will typically be about five to, um, five to hundreds of um, solar masses. This will be millions of solar masses and more. And one of the outstanding problems of physics was that there is no limit on what the size limit can be. So the question is whether there are black holes say of 1000 solar masses or 2000 solar masses or so on. Because we, in our galaxy we saw 5 to 100 solar masses at the most, not even 100 solar masses. In, in galaxies you see millions to trillion, million solar masses. Then um, Einstein comes out with a very strange idea in his uh, general theory of relativity. And it is worth looking at it because it has direct relevance to black hole physics. General relativity showed that you can you should not treat space and time as separate entities, but they are they are in fact a single entity that he calls space time. And space time, when you take it as a single entity, is exchanges. 
because then you can look at the universe as as a tapestry of space time in which mass is simply an equivalent of the amount of digging you have done so for example if there is a low solar mass star this this kind of a gull that is formed or the hole that is formed is not very deep if you have a higher mass star the hole can be very deep and in case of a black hole this hole is essentially infinitely long so the the idea is that you can look at space time not as um, as uh, space and time being separate but space time become together in this fabric and they also distort both space and time and because the space uh, distort space and time this jet projection is only along the uh, rotation rotation axis because i um, mean the within this uh, hole the rotation axis will define the center of the hole for you um then one of the things that i said predicted was that if if mass is actually just a question of hole in the space time then every time this material moves it will produce a disturbance in space time that will be seen as gravitational waves so even though einstein had predicted gravitational waves more than 100 years ago only recently we have started this gravitational events now of course we have seen many many more than five events we have seen more than like 25 events of a uh, gravitational waves produced by a disturbance of disturbance due to mass now normal mass like the sun or something similar will not produce sufficiently intense um, gravitational waves for us to detect it for us to detect you have to look at um, look at um, the objects of the size of a black hole or a neutron star which will produce enough disturbance for you to be able to see so what we have seen in gravitational wave detectors is the black hole mergers and black hole disturbances and we have seen neutron neutron star mergers we have seen black hole mergers and a whole bunch of things and i'll show you what all that we have seen essentially what the what um, the ligo detector for uh, black or uh, for um, gravitational wave does is that it has very long baseline interferometer so um, it, there is a center over here and then it emits it takes a beam of light splits it into two it sends one light 4 kilometers away in a mirror over here and brings it back another one perpendicular to it 4 kilometers away puts a mirror and brings it back and when the two come together if they have come travel the exactly the same distance then they will merge constructively but even if if one of them has been slightly disturbed even by the width of less than the size of a nucleus even if it has disturbed slightly then the light that comes back will not be in phase and you will see a disturbance here essentially you have this situation over here you have the light source coming in it is split into two and if the if the situation is perfectly symmetric the uh, uh, symmetrical and the distances are absolutely correct then you will have a constructive interference but now for some reason if a gravity wave passes through uh, then it will it will push the mirror slightly away now this is highly exaggerated but even if it is moved by less than the width of the nucleus of an atom this in constructive interference will be lost and that this that loss in constructive interference will tell you how much this mirror has moved with respect to this and that tells you that a gravitational wave passed through and it can of course happen in either of the directions you can have it in one direction or another direction in one case it can squeeze and the other case it can elongate and therefore these disturbances can be seen so if you have two black holes that have merged then as the merging happens the gravitational waves that come originally come in sine waves as they are going together and as they very come very close to each other and merge the signal becomes more and more intense because of the rotational frequency keeps on reducing until it becomes one large ringing sound and at the end of the ringing sound you have a new black hole which is the sum total of the black mass of the two black holes that originally existed So if you take two five solar masses or stars, you will get a ten solar mass black hole at the end, and you can see this ringing. And because one detector can make uh, an error, LIGO has at least two detectors. Um, the third one they are planning to set up in India and so on, so that you definitely have multiple detectors seeing the same effect, so that you can be sure that it is happening. Currently, they have two detectors on two sides of America, and therefore that is good enough, and they have seen black hole mergers. so this what you have below is the separation between the two black holes and you can see that the separation turns to zero um, in a matter of few seconds and the relative velocity go, comes to over 0.6 times the velocity of the sun in a matter of uh, 0.6 times the velocity of light in a matter of few seconds so as they come and merge together 
they really move very fast and bang into each other and the last sigh is this ringing before this new black hole is formed. So essentially you have these two black holes that will go and merge. And what LIGO has done is to show you multiple cases of these black hole black hole mergers. Where for example one black hole of 20 solar masses and one black hole of 35 solar masses has merged to give you a black hole which is 45 solar masses or 50 solar masses. Then they have seen an example of a 40 solar mass black hole merging with a 30 solar mass black hole to give you a 70 solar mass black hole and so on. In some cases they have not been able to fully estimate the um, um, sorry, um, in, in so all these uh, blue ones that you see are all observations from LIGO of black hole mergers and you can see that in, in the best case we have seen 80 or 80 solar mass black hole is the maximum we have seen where a 30 solar mass black hole and a 50 solar mass black hole merge to give you an 80 solar mass black hole. Um, on the other end the black holes that we have seen through electromagnetic radiations and the maximum that we have seen is 20 solar masses. This is in the galaxy, not in the center of star, center of galaxy. But we have seen uh, um, um, the stellar mass black holes typically about 20 solar masses. While with LIGO, we have now seen black holes of 80 solar masses. Um, it has also seen some neutron star mergers um, from 1 to 1.4 solar mass. Of course, is the Chandrasekhar limit. But we have, we have seen two neutron stars merge into something else. Uh, if it is small enough, it remains a neutron star, but it remains an unusually large neutron star. But we have seen this kind of mergers of neutron stars in LIGO uh, also. So LIGO has given us a window to these uh, black holes of um, various sizes merging, producing a disturbance in the space time, which we have been able to detect. And uh, the nearest black hole now we know is a combination of three black holes of, of two stars and a black hole. So the two stars are visible, that, but they are going around an object or their center of mass where the third object is unknown. And, it, and because it is invisible, but its mass can be measured by the rotational curves, we know that it is a black hole which is four times the mass of the sun. So we have even seen this kind of nearest black hole, which is not very far from us, just 1000 light years from us. So typically what happens in a black hole is that you have the black hole. Then people have tried to image the black hole. Like I said, in the space time, it makes a very deep, uh, infinitely deep curve with the event horizon somewhere over here or the short cell radius somewhere over here. So you have the black hole in the center and the event horizon over here. And then you have, so you have the black hole in the center, then you have the event horizon on the sides, and then you have the photosphere from which light will come out and so on. And you have the relativistic jet over here. And this is the disk from which material is falling into this black hole. When you look at it through telescope, because the gravity of um, black holes is very strong, you not only see the light from the star, part of the star that is towards us, but even light from the part that is away from us is bent sufficiently for us to be able to see it in our telescope. So this is the um, movie uh, interstellar the simulation of a black hole will look like. Uh, this is the accretion disk that you see edge on um, that is towards you. But this light that you see, the circular light that you see, <laughs> is from the material that is behind the black hole that is being bent by the black hole. So this is the event horizon of the black hole and light close to it is bent towards you and um, that you can see. And the structure in the um, uh, in the light emission is an indicator of the stru uh, structure in the accretion disk of the black hole. So this is the black hole um, center over here. The accretion disk is over here, the front of it. The back of the accretion disk is seen from here and this is an extremely accurate supercomputer simulation of what light from black hole will look like. So even though it is a movie, the simulation has been physically very accurate. Also because of the fact that blue shifted light is up here brighter, so if you have a black hole over here in an accretion disk and if it is moving like this, then the light of part of the accretion disk that is coming towards you will give you much greater intensity. So you have this bright part and you have the dull part, which means that the black hole is rotating in a clockwise direction and this is the material that is coming towards you and this is what you would expect to see. So if you look at a black hole and see it um, in this case uh, edge on uh, with the front and the back, uh, so um, at a reasonable angle you can see that you would see this bright spot and you would see this accretion disk to a limited, uh, limited level. But in extreme exact right angle, you would essentially see only the back of the black hole. 
the front of the black hole essentially would be such a thin disk that you may not be able to see it. If you are looking at a black hole at around 45 degrees to reducing angle, you can see uh, how the shape changes. So this is absolutely 90 degrees face on uh, seeing a black hole. This is absolutely edge on seeing the black hole rotation. So the, in this case, the black hole rotation axis is coming out of you. In this case, the black hole, uh, sorry, in this case, the uh, black hole rotation material is um, vertical and in this case the black hole rotation axis is coming towards you and you can see as the angle changes from 90 degrees to 0 degrees you can see more and more of the accretion disk so you start from here you go all the way over here and then you come into increasing angles until um, sorry 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 and then when you see it face on you will see it fairly symmetrical if you see it edge on you will see this one side um, blue shifted and the other side red shifted but the interesting features of course are when you can see something like this and we have an observation of a black hole in m87 that looks like this and that you will immediately identify somewhere in between these two and so you have a black hole the photograph is of m87 the black the image is 40 arc micro arc second to give you an idea about how small a micro arc second is one degree uh, the circle is 360 degrees um so you have one uh, so you, uh, one degree is one upon 360 of the circle one minute is 60 sec, uh, 60 uh, 60 minutes make one degree so one minute is one sixtieth of a degree one um, uh, arc second is one sixtieth of a minute so it is one upon three thousand six hundred of a degree and one microsecond is a thousandth of that. That is how small this area is. One upon thousand of a one upon thousand three six uh, three six zero zero of a degree is how small this region is. The black hole in this case is six point five times the size of the um, sun. Uh, that's about thousand times bigger than our own uh, black hole. And um, the size of this object is one light year. Light takes one one light day. I beg your pardon. Light takes one day to cross this region. And what we are seeing in this case is uh, this um, dark matter, the jets, etc. over here, the gravitational lensing effect of bending light over here. And this is roughly the kind of thing that we would expect to see. And that's what we are seeing in this uh, particular um, black hole. So there is, there is initial primary lensing and there is secondary lensing, etc. which eventually give you this kind of a shape. Now with improved um, uh, telescope and more telescope sign, we have even seen these striations in this black hole. And these striations tell you that there is magnetic field in this region. So not only do you have space-time curvature and striations, you also have black holes associated, magnetic fields associated with black hole. So that is the story of the black holes. The bottom line therefore is that stars are born, they live and they uh, their life and they die. They are born of gas in interstellar medium through compression either artificially or um, by routine by simply flux of time. Uh, they live up to um, uh, reactions of four protons going to hydrogen in their first thing and then burn heavier elements up to iron. When they die, when they run out of helium, they essentially explode and they can behave as spectacular events of unusual objects. The so sun will become a giant whose radius will be one astronomical unit. So the earth will be on the surface of the sun. And in other cases, of course, the supergiants can be much, much larger. They can go all the way to the radius of Mars. And then the stars die. So essentially, stars make an interesting story. And all I want to say now is thank you very much for your patience. And I've left myself some 10 minutes or 15 minutes for questions. If you have any questions, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, visitor uh, means uh, participants are encouraged to ask uh, questions. Uh, this was one of the uh, very uh, important talks in this uh, FDP in the sense that uh, stellar physics, because stars actually constitutes everything up, means uh, so we are, by understanding stars, many things are understood, the, how the way it is. So we should ask questions. Some questions. Everybody is hungry and thirsty. <laughs> Any questions? 
we started from light and ended up with black holes so at least somewhere mm. some question should have been there <laughs> no, by the way if you want to look at this powerpoint uh, um, ganguly has it yeah. so you can take it from yeah me. yeah i will i will post it uh, but yeah i will post the powerpoint it is there with me i will post the link uh but uh, one thing is that i will post the recorded part also we are we are recording all these sessions so, okay. uh, so i will post this uh not only the power part the thing is that the interpretation is also equally important how it is uh, each picture has to be uh, understood um, so if, if uh, any clarification or if any slides uh, if you want certain uh, questions so that will be good actually uh, interaction should be good there is one question in the chat uh, there is a problem. can you see would you like to or i will read it how okay. uh, how understanding the nearest star sun can help us in understanding stellar evolution that is a question so what, what hap- yeah so what happens is that i had talked to you about um, our predictions about the structure of the uh, of a star and saying that the thermal balance happens and the opacity happens and um, heat etc so models we can make we can also ask your computer to write um, uh, make a star within its calculation the question is how accurate are these and sun has been a major laboratory for this because there is one aspect of the stellar physics which i didn't talk about is surface oscillations so for some the for the because it's a convection zone just as boiling water has this uh, has a tapering effect the surface of the bla- uh, for star also oscillates now the short period oscillations typically tend to remain on the surface but the long period oscillations actually go to the depth of the star because their wavelength is very long so they it can be a fraction of the solar radius itself and therefore it can appear just two or three peaks in the entire cycle and because these waves go deep inside and are refracted by the density fluctuations in the core of the um, star or, or core of the sun you can actually determine the value of kappa and density and density fluctuations um, in us in in case of the sun with great precision because you can look at these oscillations with great precision you can determine the exact density and opacity profile of the sun which you cannot do for other stars or not at least um, as of today's technologies um, so sun becomes a big lab for studying or checking or testing our predictions of stellar structure um, um, narrowing down the values of kappa and uh, whether the cp by cv value that we have talked about about uh, ideal gas equations etc we have done it in our labs at densities and temperatures which are much lower than what you see in the center of the star whether those equations hold or not whether our predictions are correct whether the opacity calculation that we have made are correct or not whether the nucleosynthesis calculation that we have made correct or not can be tested on the sun because the sun's vibrating surface gives you signals from the depth of the sun and therefore you can study the depth of the of a star only in the case of the sun yeah actually uh, uh, i am uh, dr rakesh majumdar i uh, have been a solar physicist okay. and recently joined ncsm as a Q- physics curator so oh, okay. Uh, okay. yeah so i was just uh, since nobody is uh, asking okay, okay. So, so you are uh, point it out yes yeah, so solar oscillations is a, is a very yeah. big field Yeah. now with um, with um, uh, the data from kepler etc people are also trying to study stellar or nuclear uh, oscillations oscillations yeah. so my statement that only on the sun that you can do study these things yeah, is yeah. actually al- is uh, strictly for 2022 by the time 2024 2025 come we will start right. in profiles of the stars yeah. which are at a reasonable distance yeah so my my work has been contains a more on the atmosphere okay. uh, and uh, corona solar filament That's okay so uh, i think somebody will talk about the sun right the temperature inversion which is one of the most curious things on yesterday the sun. actually we have finished uh, the solar physics talk okay okay yeah yeah since nobody was asking questions so i just took the opportunity yeah yeah okay okay thanks for pointing out the solar oscillations yes yeah okay. i think there's one more question in the chat no that is a comment uh, it's a comment okay. question uh, any other question somebody can come out with some question Or some discussion or comment. 1:30 in the afternoon, sir. Everybody is angry. <laughs> I, I don't blame them. If you have any questions, yeah. give them to Bangali and let him send it by email. I'll respond no, by email. Uh, we have. I have. I actually we have a WhatsApp group for this uh, program, and okay. I have sent you the link. Uh, so if you please right, join right. for certain time. Right. So if somebody puts a question on the WhatsApp, I will answer. Uh, there is you, no problem. Yeah, you can join the group so that you can answer it there or give some. Oh, okay, I will do that. Sir. Yeah, I, I have given the thing. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. I will do that. Thank you. Okay, so now, possible. yeah, now since uh, no other uh, questions are there, uh, I would thank Dr. Uh, Professor Bahia uh, to have given a wonderful talk and uh, so we uh, conclude this uh, session for the time being and again we break for lunch and come back uh, again at 2.30 for our next session. Thank you.